Welcome to Hollywood Graveyard, where we set out to remember and celebrate the lives of those who lived to entertain us by visiting their final resting places. Today we conclude our tour across England, where we'll find such stars as the Bronte sisters, Gladys Cooper, Spike Milligan, and many more. Join us, won't you? It's the home stretch of our tour of famous graves across England. We've visited some amazing and legendary men and women so far, seen some incredible sights, and today will be no exception. Not a lot in the way of preamble, so let's get rolling. We'll be accompanied on our tour today by the English cousin of Close Up, the Hollywood Forever Cemetery Cat, who I've named Sir Alfred Hitchcat. If you haven't done so already, be sure to check out parts one and two. Our first two stops today aren't graves, but memorial markers. We're back in the Stratford-upon-Avon area at the Royal Shakespeare Company's Swan Theatre. On the grounds of this storied place near the river is a memorial to a lass unparalleled, Vivian Lee, one of the greatest actresses of classic stage and cinema. In 1939, she won the most coveted role in Hollywood, the role for which she would be best known, that of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. The role won her an Oscar. You'll never corner me, Red Butler, or frighten me. You've lived in dirt so long, you can't understand anything else. And you're jealous of something you can't understand. Good night. She would go on to win another Oscar for her role as Blanche Dubois in a streetcar named Desire. She was also well known as a stage performer, bringing to life characters such as Ophelia, Juliet, and Lady Macbeth. In 1940, she became one half of an acting power couple when she married Laurence Olivier. Vivian suffered from chronic tuberculosis much of her life. The disease would eventually claim her life in 1967 at the age of 53. After her death, Vivian was cremated at Golders Green, her ashes scattered on the lake of her Tickeridge Mill home. This stone was later placed here in her honor. Nearby is also a similar memorial marker to Billy Brown. He was an Australian actor and playwright. Early in his career he joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, where he would become the first Australian commissioned to write and perform in his own play, The Swan Down Gloves. He would also appear in a handful of film and TV productions like Fierce Creatures and The Chronicles of Narnia, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. He returned to Australia in 1996 where he would continue to perform on stage and live out the rest of his days. He died from cancer at age 61. Let's head now to Henley-on-Thames in Oxfordshire and St. Mary the Virgin Churchyard. Here we find the grave of actress Elizabeth Spriggs. She was also a part of the Royal Shakespeare Company, winning an Olivier Award for her role in Love Letters on Blue Paper. On film, she was nominated for a BAFTA for her role in Sense and Sensibility, and Harry Potter fans will recognize her as the first actress to play the Fat Lady in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. She lived to be 78. Next up is All Saints Church in Broadchalk. In the grounds of this churchyard is the grave of Cecil Beaton. He was an artist and photographer, as well as a stage and costume designer. He's perhaps best remembered for designing the sets and costumes for the 1964 film My Fair Lady. He won two Oscars for My Fair Lady. He had also won an Oscar for designing the costumes for Gigi in 1958. He also designed for stage productions winning four Tony Awards, including for the stage production of My Fair Lady. And as a photographer, he took the official portrait of Queen Elizabeth II on her coronation day. Cecil Beaton lived to be 76. This is Holy Cross Cemetery in Avening. And here is the grave of Pamela Brown. She was an actress whose career began on stage in England and subsequently America. She began landing film roles in the 40s, often performing in historical dramas like Richard III, Cleopatra, and the Van Gogh biopic, Lust for Life. She won an Emmy for her role in Victoria Regina. Pamela was just 58 when she died from cancer. Next to Pamela is her partner, a film director and optimist, Michael Powell. 
In the 40s and 50s he directed a number of classic British films, including Black Narcissus and The Red Shoes, and received an Oscar nomination for One of Our Aircraft is Missing. His 1960 film Peeping Tom was controversial in its day, but has since become a cult classic, a progenitor to the slasher genre. Michael died from cancer at age 84. Not far from here, in the small rural area of Blackland, is St. Peter's Church. On these grounds is the grave of David Hemmings. He was an actor and director, known as an icon of the groovy London pop culture movement in the 60s and 70s. As an actor, he's perhaps best remembered for his lead role in the counterculture 1966 film Blow Up, the film which won the Palme d'Or at Cannes the following year. Other film roles include Dildano in Barbarella and Cassius in Gladiator. Later in his career, he would direct a number of television shows, including The A-Team and Magnum P.I. He died on the film set of Blessed, after suffering a heart attack at the age of 62. Taking in more of this beautiful England countryside, we're in Bowerchalk and Holy Trinity Churchyard. Resting under a large yew tree is author William Golding. He's best known for his debut 1954 novel, Lord of the Flies, considered one of the century's great novels. It would be adapted on film a number of times. Golding would go on to publish another 11 novels, including his To the Ends of the Earth trilogy. And in 1983, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. Golding died from heart failure at age 81. Over now to St. Cross Churchyard in Hollywell, Oxford. In the southwest corner of the churchyard we find the final resting place of another storied writer, Kenneth Graham. He's fondly remembered for penning the children's classic The Wind in the Willows, published in 1908. It would inspire the play Toad of Toad Hall, and Disney would also adapt The Wind in the Willows, as well as another of Graham's stories, The Reluctant Dragon. So next time you enjoy a spin on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride at Disneyland, think of Mr. Graham here. He died in 1932 at age 73. In another part of this cemetery, alive with lush foliage, is an important figure of English sacred music, John Stainer. He was active and very popular during the Victorian era, and is perhaps best known today for his oratorio, The Crucifixion, often performed at Passiontide in Anglican churches. Stainer died in 1901 at age 60. This is Ebden Road Cemetery in Weston Supermare, Somerset. Here lies popular television personality and journalist Jill Dando. She's remembered for having hosted a number of shows in the 90s, perhaps most notably a show called Crime Watch UK, a British analog of America's Most Wanted. She would often end the show by reminding viewers that most people never experience a crime. There was tragic irony in these words. On the morning of April 26, 1999, Jill was shot and killed execution style on the doorstep of her own home. She was 37. And in another tragic twist of irony, her own murder would be featured on Crime Watch UK, the very show she had hosted in an attempt to solve her murder. A man was tried and convicted, but later acquitted on an appeal. Her murder remains unsolved. I just love these rural English churchyards, don't you? This is St. Andrew's Churchyard in Mel's Somerset. And among those resting in peace here is Siegfried Sassoon. He's considered one of the leading poets of the World War I era. Having served during the war and witnessed firsthand its brutalities, he would go on to write angry and impassioned poetry about the horrors of war. He would also receive acclaim for his prose work, including the Shurston Trilogy. Sassoon died from cancer at age 80. Hope you brought your umbrella, because those autumn rains are back. This is Allerton Cemetery in the Liverpool area, where we find the grave of singer and entertainer Scylla Black. 
Early in her career she was championed by the Beatles, and would go on to have hits in the songs Anyone Who Had a Heart, Anyone who had a heart would take me in his and You're My World. You're my world, you're every move I made. Between 1968 and 1976 she hosted her own variety program, Scylla, on BBC TV, and later hosted hit shows like Blind Date and Surprise Surprise. She died at age 72 after suffering a stroke and a fall in her home. Also here at Allerton we find delightfully eccentric comedian Ken Dodd. Dotty, as he was known, was considered one of the last great music hall entertainers. His stand-up routines would often run for hours, with strings of surreal jokes, rapid one-liners, physical comedy, and songs. So long were his performances he once earned a place in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest ever joke-telling session, 1,500 jokes in three and a half hours. His career spanned some 60 years, continuing to make audiences laugh well into his 80s. He lived to be 90. Next up we visit Liverpool Long Lane Jewish Cemetery. Beatles fans know this name, Brian Epstein. He was a music manager in the 60s, best known for having managed the Beatles from 1962 until his death. He was instrumental in discovering the Fab Four and helping develop their image, abandoning the scruff in favor of their iconic, clean-cut style and matching suits, and also for landing a recording contract with George Martin. Within months, the Beatles were international stars. And like Martin, Epstein was sometimes referred to as the fifth Beatle. Epstein also signed Scylla Black, who we visited earlier. He died from an accidental drug overdose at the age of 32. Death must be so beautiful to lie in the soft brown earth with the grasses waving above one's head and listen to silence. This is St. Thomas Becket and Thomas the Apostle Churchyard in Heptonstall where lies Sylvia Plath. She was a poet and author known for the genre of confessional poetry. Her best known works are the published collections The Colossus and Other Poems and Ariel. She also published a semi-autobiographical novel, The Bell Jar, shortly before her death. It dealt with her struggles with depression and mental illness. On February 11, 1963, Sylvia took her own life by carbon monoxide poisoning in her London flat her head placed in the oven with the gas turned on. She was 30. In 1982, she was posthumously awarded the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. The inscription on her stone here was chosen by her husband, Ted Hughes, believed to be a Buddhist or Hindu quote. You'll also note the name Hughes has been rubbed out. Over the years, vandals have repeatedly tried to remove the name Hughes from her stone, as many blame him for her death and are aggrieved at the way he handled her legacy. Our journey north continues in Haworth, where we find St. Michael and All Angels Church. A famous literary family has a strong association with this church, where they now rest. In 1820, Patrick Bronte became the vicar of this parish, which he would serve for 41 years. He's known for having a number of very talented and famous children. In the vault beneath this pillar rests the Bronte sisters. Emily Bronte was an author and poet born in 1818. Even though she only wrote one novel in her short life, she's considered a major English literary figure. The book was Wuthering Heights, first published in 1847 under the pen name Ellis Bell. It was initially met with controversy, having challenged Victorian ideals about religion, morality, class, and a woman's place in society. Since its publication, there have been numerous adaptations of Wuthering Heights on stage, radio, television, and film. Emily's health began to decline in 1848, compounded by unsanitary conditions, their water source thought to be contaminated by runoff from the church's graveyard. In September of that year, Emily caught a severe cold at her brother Branwell's funeral, which led to tuberculosis. By December, she was dead. Having grown so thin, her coffin only measured 16 inches wide. Resting alongside her sister is Charlotte Bronte, also a writer. The same year Emily published Wuthering Heights, Charlotte published the novel Jane Eyre, under the pen name Currer Bell, 
The sisters used pen names to mask their gender. Jane Eyre would become one of the most famous romance novels of all time, and was revolutionary in its approach to prose and first-person narrative. With its novel treatment of sexuality and feminism, Jane Eyre was once even labeled as being unsuitable for young ladies. And of course, countless adaptations would follow. Charlotte didn't live much longer than her sister, dying at the age of 38. The cause was given as tuberculosis, but researchers believe complications of a pregnancy were also contributing factors. Poor Patrick Bronte didn't just bury his two daughters, he buried every one of his children and his wife. Maria died at age 38 from cancer, daughter Maria died at age 12, Elizabeth age 10, and son Branwell age 31, all from tuberculosis. The only Bronte sibling not buried here is Anne. She died at age 29 from tuberculosis and was buried at St. Mary's in Scarborough. We visited Anne in part 4 of our viewers special. Turning back south again, we're at Upper Thong in West Yorkshire and St. John the Evangelist Churchyard. Here we find Bill Owen. As an actor, he's perhaps best remembered for playing Campo in the long-running BBC comedy series Last of the Summer Wine, which ran from 1973 until 2010. The Wellington boots you see here on his grave are an allusion to that role. Owen was also a regular in the Carry On films, and even had a career as a songwriter and playwright. He continued entertaining audiences until his death at age 85 from pancreatic cancer, choosing to be buried here, near where Last of the Summer Wine was filmed. Next to Bill is his Last of the Summer Wine co-star, Peter Salas, who played Clegg in close to 300 episodes of the beloved comedy. And fans of Wallace and Gromit will recognize him as the voice of Wallace in various TV, film, and video game productions. Gromit! That's it! Cheese! We'll go somewhere where there's cheese! Peter Salas lived to the ripe old age of 96, dying of natural causes in 2017. Still further south in Little Ponton is St. Guthlick's Churchyard. Confession, I'd never heard of St. Guthlick. But now I know, he was a saint from this region of England, Lincolnshire. And herein lies actor Richard Todd. He received both a Golden Globe and Academy Award nomination for his role as Corporal McLaughlin in the 1949 film The Hasty Heart. No doubt his experiences serving and fighting during World War II as a captain during the D-Day landings would inform his performance. He would become known for war dramas, including The Dam Busters. He played Robin Hood in the live-action Disney adaptation, and was even Ian Fleming's first choice to play James Bond, but due to scheduling conflicts, the role went to Sean Connery. Richard Todd lived to be 90. We're back down now in the south of England, at All Saints Church in Dane Hill. Life is real, and death is the illusion. So reads the epitaph of Peter Butterworth. His military career ended when he was shot down by Germans during World War II and captured as a prisoner of war. He briefly escaped before being recaptured by those pesky Hitler youth. While in the prisoner camp, he met and befriended Talbot Rothwell, who would go on to write many of the Carry On films. They would perform together in the camp shows, and after the war, Butterworth would become a regular in the Carry On films, making 16 appearances in the series. He's also known for his roles in children's radio and television, and for playing the monk in Doctor Who. Butterworth died after suffering a heart attack at age 63. Resting here with Peter is his wife, Janet Brown. She was an actress, comedian, and impressionist, known particularly for her spot-on impersonation of Margaret Thatcher in the 70s and 80s. She lived to be 87. Next up is this wonderfully photogenic churchyard at Winchelsea Church. This is where we find the final resting place of a legend of British comedy, Spike Milligan. He's known for being a co-creator, writer, and principal cast member of The Goon Show, with Peter Sellers and Harry Seacombe, who we visited in previous tours. The Goon Show was a predecessor and great influence of comedy troupes like Monty Python, beginning on radio in the 50s and later expanding into film and television. Milligan is partly responsible for the more absurdist shift in both British and American comedy in the 50s and 60s. 
He also wrote comedic poetry, as well as a number of books documenting his time during World War II, beginning with Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. Spike died from kidney failure at age 83. A humorist to the end, he wrote his own obituary, stating that he wrote The Goon Show and died. He also wanted the words, I told you I was ill, inscribed on his tombstone, but the churchyard refused the epitaph. As a compromise, the phrase was inscribed with the Irish translation. Circling back around to the Greater London area, we find ourselves in Cranford and St. Dunstan with Holy Angels Churchyard. Here lies Tony Hancock, a popular comedian and entertainer of the 50s and 60s, who found great success in the BBC series Hancock's Half Hour, a radio comedy and later TV series. He also had a brief film career, including 1961's Call Me Genius. But as his career began to decline, he fell deeper into discouragement and alcohol, eventually taking his own life by overdose while in Australia at the age of 44. He was cremated there and returned here to be laid to rest. Man, even the signs are cool here. As it reads, this is St. Mary the Virgin Church in Radnage, Buckinghamshire. What will survive of us is love. So reads the epitaph of actress Wendy Hiller. She was principally known as a stage actress, a favorite of George Bernard Shaw, and preferring modern dramas like those of Henrik Ibsen over classics like Shakespeare. But she did shine on film, earning an Oscar nomination for her role as Eliza Doolittle in Shaw's Pygmalion. She would also be nominated for her role in A Man for All Seasons, and win the Oscar for Separate Tables. Wendy Hiller lived to be 90. The City of London Cemetery was established in 1856, one of the early public cemeteries to open in response to overcrowding in London churchyards. Another of the great actresses of British stage and screen rests in these historic grounds, Anna Neagle. In 1949 she was voted the most popular star in Britain. She brought much needed levity to war-torn Britain with musicals, comedies, and historical dramas. She often portrayed historical figures, including Nell Gwynn, Florence Nightingale, and Queen Victoria in two films. Her proudest role on film was that of French resistance fighter Odette. Anna Neagle lived to be 81 and rests here with her husband. Their grave was recommemorated by Princess Anne in 2014. Anna's husband, Herbert Wilcox, was an award-winning film producer and director, the two often collaborating. Among the films they made together are Victoria the Great, The Lady with a Lamp, and Odette. He lived to be 87. Also here at the City of London Cemetery we find Christopher Wicking. He was a screenwriter, known for his work writing horror films in the 70s, including Murders in the Rue Morgue, To the Devil a Daughter, and Scream and Scream Again. He died at the age of 65 after suffering a heart attack. One last stop here at the City of London Cemetery. Joseph Merrick was better known in his life as the Elephant Man. He suffered from a condition that caused his body to deform from an early age, believed to have been Proteus Syndrome. Shunned by society, he did the only thing people in his position could do. He joined a circus freak show. He eventually made his way to the London Hospital where he was cared for for the remainder of his life. He died at age 27. His body was donated to science. His skeleton is held by Queen Mary University of London's medical school and after extensive research into his condition, the rest of him was laid to rest here. His life was dramatized in the 1980 David Lynch film, The Elephant Man. The film was nominated for eight Oscars and won the BAFTA for Best Film. We head now to St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Leytonstone. Here lies actor Stephen Lewis. He was another regular on The Last of the Summer Wine as Smiler. He's also known for his role as Blakey, on the sitcom On the Buses, a role he reprised in the 1971 film. He boarded the last bus to the cemetery gates at age 88. This is Downs Crematorium in Brighton. Here we find the cheeky chappy Max Miller, regarded as one of the great stand-up comedians of his generation in the 30s through the 50s. Censorship was strict in his era, so he often relied on innuendo, 
getting away with risque humor by allowing the audiences to fill in the punchline of a joke, then blaming the audiences for being the ones with the dirty minds. He also starred in a number of films, including Educated Evans. And if you know where to look, you'll spot Max Miller on the cover of the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. He lived to be 68. Long Buckby is our next stop at St. Lawrence Churchyard. This is Stanley Unwin. His career as an entertainer began quite by accident. He was a radio engineer, and while testing equipment made his first accidental transmission, ad-libbing some comedic spoof commentary. He was encouraged to go into show business, and would become known for developing his own style of linguistic comedy, dubbed Unwinese, a sort of mangled form of English in which words are altered and misused to hilarious effect. On film he can be seen as the Chancellor in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He died from natural causes at the age of 90. We find ourselves now at Hampstead Cemetery in the Greater London area. Here lies legendary actress Gladys Cooper. Her career on stage and screen spanned some seven decades, beginning in the silent era, before the First World War. Between 1917 and 1933 she managed the Playhouse Theatre, where she often performed, eventually making her way to the West End and Broadway. She received three Oscar nominations for her film roles, in My Fair Lady, The Song of Bernadette, and Now Voyager. And fans of The Twilight Zone, as you know I am. Remember her in three episodes, including one particularly chilling one, in which she receives haunting late-night phone calls from a local graveyard. Who's there? Hello? Hello? Hello. Hello. She died from pneumonia at age 82. This is St. John the Baptist Church in Little Missenden. Strolling through the churchyard we find the grave of Dulce Gray and Michael Dennison. Dulce Gray began her career as an actress on stage in productions like Brighton Rock. She would then make her way to film in melodramas like They Were Sisters. And on TV she was known as Kate Harvey on the series Howard's Way. She found a second career in writing, having penned dozens of mystery novels. She died from pneumonia at age 95. Her husband Michael Dennison is also here, an actor often seen as the quintessential English gentleman. He starred with his wife in Angels 1-5, and also starred in The Importance of Being Earnest. He died from cancer at age 82. Myriad are the churches named St. Mary's in England. This one is located in Wargrave, Berkshire. Along the southern wall we find character actor Robert Morley, often seen as the pompous Englishman. He received an Oscar nomination for his role as Louis XVI in the 1938 film Marie Antoinette. Other notable films include Major Barbara alongside Wendy Hiller and The African Queen. He died after suffering a stroke at age 84. Also here is Robert's son Sheridan, who was a distinguished writer and theatre critic in London. Our next stop is Banbury Crematorium in Oxfordshire. Here we find one of the two Ronnies, Ronnie Barker, a man who made comedy look effortlessly funny. The Two Ronnies was a popular sketch comedy show in the 70s and 80s, which Ronnie Barker wrote and starred in, with another Ronnie, Ronnie Corbett. Other sitcoms include Porridge and Open All Hours. Ronnie died from heart failure at age 76. We're in East Preston, West Sussex, and St. Mary the Virgin Churchyard, where rests Stanley Holloway. He was an actor and humorist, known for his comic monologues and songs. On stage and screen, he's perhaps best remembered for his role as Alfred P. Doolittle in My Fair Lady. The role earned him an Oscar nomination. He can also be seen in Brief Encounter, and as the gravedigger in Hamlet. He lived to be 91. A lot of longevity among those we visited today. In Little Malvern is St. Wolston Roman Catholic Cemetery. Here lies British composer Edward Elgar. 
Among his best known orchestral works is the series of marches, the Pomp and Circumstance marches. The theme from the first march was adapted as the official coronation music for King Edward VII, and today is instantly recognized as the Graduation March tune. And among his notable choral works is The Dream of Gerontius. He would be one of the first composers to take gramophone recordings seriously, conducting a series of recordings of his own work beginning in 1914. Elgar died from cancer at age 76. If you're tired of grave hunting, we could always kick back and watch a game of cricket. What's that you say? You're not tired of grave hunting? Good. Neither am I. This is Golders Green Jewish Cemetery, across the street from the Golders Green Crematorium. Here we find one of the great musical interpreters of Elgar, Jacqueline Dupre. She was a musical child prodigy, a cellist who achieved mainstream popularity, becoming regarded as one of the greatest cellists of all time. Her career was cut short by a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, which forced her to stop performing at just 28. The disease took her life at age 42. A film was made about her life, titled Hillary and Jackie. Not far from Jacqueline is screenwriter and producer Jack Rosenthal, one of the small screen's great dramatists. He wrote over a hundred episodes of Coronation Street. Other of his well-known TV plays include Bar Mitzvah Boy, The Evacuees, and Spend, Spend, Spend. He also wrote for film, including Yentl, starring Barbara Streisand. He died at age 72 from cancer. From a Jewish cemetery to a Catholic church. This is St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church in the London area. In a quiet corner lit by colorful light from stained glass windows, we find Marie Tussaud. Thanks to Madame Tussaud, many of us can get up close and personal with our favorite stars, or at least with wax figure effigies of our favorite stars. Marie was a sculptor who worked in France, known for sculpting wax figures of famous people. She learned from Philippe Curtius, who in 1765 created what is the oldest waxwork figure of Madame du Barry, which is still on display at Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum. During the French Revolution, she was imprisoned and given the gruesome responsibility of making wax death masks of recently guillotined notables, among them Marie Antoinette. After the war, she relocated to London, where she opened Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum in 1835. In the centuries since, branches have opened across the world including one back home in Hollywood, where you can strike a pose with Marilyn Monroe, among others. This St. Mary's Churchyard is located in ross on wye in Herefordshire. This is the final resting place of Dennis Potter, considered one of the most influential and innovative dramatists in British television. He received acclaim for productions like The Singing Detective and the 1978 musical drama serial Pennies from Heaven, which would be adapted on film in 1981. The film adaptation earned him an Oscar nomination. His writing for film also includes Dream Child and Gorky Park. He even has a writing award named after him. In 1994, Potter was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He named his cancer Rupert, after Rupert Murdoch, a man he held in the same regard as the cancerous growth inside of him. He was just 59 when he died. Also here at St. Mary's we find actress Noel Gordon. She's remembered for her role as Meg Mortimer in close to 300 episodes of the long-running British soap opera Crossroads in the 60s to the 80s. She also has the distinction of being the first woman seen on color television during experimental transmissions in 1928. She died from cancer at age 65. Just north of here is picturesque Great Malvern Cemetery. In these grounds we find a woman known as the Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lind. She was an opera singer regarded as one of the greatest sopranos of the 19th century. Her career began in her native Stockholm and she would become highly sought after throughout Europe. In 1850, at the invitation of showman P.T. Barnum, Jenny Lind came to America where she toured and sang in some 93 hugely popular concerts, raising money for various charities. If you saw The Greatest Showman, 
Jenny was portrayed in that film by Rebecca Ferguson. The Swedish Nightingale settled in England, passing away at the age of 67. And finally, my friends, we reach Adelston Cemetery in Surrey. This is the final resting place of Rod Hull, a beloved comedian and entertainer in the 70s and 80s. He's best remembered for teaming up with a silent, flightless puppet bird, an emu, which often created a sort of gleeful havoc in their appearances on television. The bird would appear to have a mind of its own, sometimes attacking the poor hosts to hilarious effect. Among these unwitting hosts was Johnny Carson. There's a way of making friends with him if you have to go, who's a pretty emu then? Who wants a little chucky 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 too? <laughs> See? See not? No. You try it. No, you don't. It's not here? Yeah. Who's a little emu? <laughs> In 1999, Rod was up on his roof adjusting his TV antenna. Tragically, he slipped and fell from the roof, dying from the injuries he sustained in the fall. Rod Hull was 63. As for Emu, he, along with his creator, will live forever in the hearts of those who simply need a good laugh. And so, as our time in England comes to an end, to quote Rod Hull, I loves ya. That's why I say cheerio, not goodbye. And that concludes our tour. What are some of your favorite memories of the stars we visited today? Share them in the comments below, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more famous grave tours. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.